Our speaker tonight has returned to UMD after a three-year stay in Australia. Dr. Jeremy Ude was a member of the UMD Department of Political Science from 2008 to 2016, when he left to serve as an associate professor in the Department of Political Science in the Corbell School of Asian Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University in Canberra. He also held administrative posts while he was there. He returned to UMG in July of this year as the new dean of the College of Liberal Arts. We would say that he's the prodigal son, but he's much better than that. <laughs> he left successful and returns a great success. Um, we ask that he give this lecture in a way to introduce him to all of you, to welcome him back, and to celebrate a new beginning in the College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Yud will speak tonight on globalization, the cause and the solution of, the global health of global health crises. He's an internationally recognized expert on global health politics, having authored five books, more than 40 peer-reviewed journal articles, and book chapters, and co-edited three volumes. He has also written for outlets like World, World Politics Review, Duck of Minerva, which you can ask him about later, and he has appeared in Slate, Vox, Nature, ABC Radio National, Science, Sky News, and Gizmodo. He is a member of the ed editorial board of Global Health Governance and is the current chair of Global Health Section of the International Studies Association. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Ute. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Thanks to the Allworths for your continued support of the Institute. It is exciting to be back, and it is humbling to be asked to do a lecture as part of this series. Um, and it's very exciting to be back in, in Duluth. Um, you know, it was when I signed the contract to come back to, to UMD, it was April, and I was telling some of my colleagues in Canberra, I was trying to explain Duluth to them and explain Lake Superior and just the, you know, the, all the natural beauty. I said, well, here, I'll just show you. So I put, pulled up one of those webcams that they have showing you the Duluth Harbor. That was the day that you all had the nasty snowstorm that closed <laughs> down the city for two days, and there were like 16-foot waves on Lake Superior in the middle of April. And my colleagues looked at me a little bit strange, like, you're going back to that. But then I had to explain to them that n few of the animals in uh, Duluth want to kill you, like all the other animals in Australia. So it, it all worked out. Um, and you know, thanks again, thanks to all of you for, for being here. And the talk that I'm giving tonight, Globalization, the Cause of and Solution to Global Health Crises, um, comes from the, the book that I just recently published with Roman and Littlefield, which is available in the back there if you are, are interested. But it's looking at some of these, I guess we could say, long-standing tensions that exist in terms of the sorts of things that we want to promote in the world, but also some of the, the potential consequences. And what, what I want to talk about, what I, what I want to explore um, in this talk, in which I go into in more detail in the book, is looking at where those tensions exist and why we don't have to just surrender to those tensions. Yes, there, there, there is this interplay within globalization that does potentially put us at greater risk of some of these, these uh, health outbreaks, but that doesn't mean that we should just stay where we are. It means that we need to adapt, we need to take advantage of the social, political, and economic circumstances to, uh, to actually use this as a tool for improving health. So if we're thinking about, about some of these tensions here, there's perhaps no better illustration of this than this building here. Does anyone have any idea what building this might be? <laughs> kind of looks like the UN. What's it? Kind of looks like, I mean, it's got that sort of industrial type, the, the kind of bland bureaucratic structure to it. This is actually a hotel. <laughs> but it's not just any hotel. It is the Hotel Metropole in the Kowloon section of Hong Kong. And the reason that this hotel, in fact, it's not even just the hotel that is so important. It's room 911 within the hotel. So two, four, six, eight. So we're talking about like somewhere right about there. And the reason that, that, that we, we care anything about this, I mean, the hotel seems like it's a fine place. It probably gets fine reviews on, on TripAdvisor and the like. But the reason that we care about it is because of what happened on February 21st, 2003. And on that day, a guy checks into the hotel. And he checks into to room 911. And he's a doctor. 
So a doctor um, from, from Guangzhou who has been treating these cases of atypical pneumonia over the past few months. No one quite knew what it was. No one had really seen it before. And the guy was exhausted. I mean, he'd been working really hard, and he had come to Hong Kong for a family wedding. So here's a chance, his nephew was getting married, a chance to relax, see some family members, get a break from all the, the, the rush at the, the hospital. Unfortunately, shortly after he checks into his hotel room, he starts to fall ill. He's becoming feverish, he starts vomiting a bit, and ends up going to the hospital himself. And sadly, he never checks out of the, the, the hospital. He dies about, uh, about a week and a half, two weeks after he initially checked in. Now that in and of itself is not remarkable. People get sick at hotels all the time. People traveling fall, fall ill. The issue here is that this doctor inadvertently spread what he had to the other people staying on his hotel floor. And what we now know is he had SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And because it's Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is an incredibly, um, uh, you know, it, it's a, a massive transit point for so many different people from all around the world, those people who stayed on that floor with, uh, with the, the doctor who fell ill ended up going back to their own home countries and inadvertently taking the, the virus with them. And so of the, uh, there were about 8,000 people who fell ill with SARS during the outbreak of 2002 and 2003. We can trace about half of them to this, this hotel. People who had direct contact with the doctor or who fell ill because of, they had contact with people who had, had that, that sort of contact. And so in some ways, this is an illustration of the dangers. Ease of movement, the rapid ability of, of people and goods to cross borders, um, the, the relatively free, relative free flow of traffic. This seems to illustrate, oh my goodness, it's easy for these diseases to spread rapidly, quickly. We have big international emergencies. And we saw big problems here. Like I said, about 8,000 people fell ill. About 10% of those people ended up dying. The estimated cost to the economies in the region is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to $100 billion. And for a relatively small number of, of people falling ill. So that's, kind of, that's, the, that's the threat side of things. But those same sorts of, of characteristics of globalization, about the ease of movement, about the, the ability of communication to cross borders, of people to organize and to, to circumvent um, obstacles, also come into play here. Because for a number of years, or excuse me, for a number of months, the Chinese government initially said there was nothing wrong. You don't have to worry about this. We've got it under control. It's influenza. It's something like this. Don't worry about it. But what we saw instead was that information was getting out. The Chinese government may have been trying to avoid it, may have been trying to deny it, um, but they weren't able to, to do that effectively. So at one point, Officials from the World Health Organization came to China and they wanted to inspect hospitals. They wanted to see the people who were falling ill in the hospitals. And government officials loaded up those SARS patients, put them in ambulances, and just had them drive around the city while WHO officials were at the hospitals so that there would be no patients there. Now on the one hand, that looks like government obfuscation. On the other hand, we know about this. And the reason that we were able to know about this is largely through things like text messages. People were exchanging millions and millions of text messages about the fact there's this new disease and the government's not doing something about it. And we've got reports going from doctors who were located in China going to colleagues in other countries saying, hey, we're seeing something new here. Is this something that anyone else has seen? And this information was getting outside of China and bringing in international observers bringing in organizations like the World Health Organization who tried to essentially name and shame the Chinese government, saying, look, you are not doing something about this. We are saying you need to, to do something more. You need to step in. And eventually, the Chinese government came around. And once they did, they did an incredible program and did it incredibly quickly. But it's because of that, that oversight. It's because of that, that, that sort of, of, of integration that was facilitated by globalization. So in the same way that urbanization and the ease of movement and all these other sorts of things that we think of with globalization, in the same ways that those put us at, at some measure of risk, they also open up new possibilities.
for trying to address uh, health issues. And this tension isn't necessarily new. That we, we have long known that there is a connection between the movement of goods and people and the spread of illness. We can go back to, to the plague. You know, the Black Death, you can kind of follow the trading, uh, the, the, the trading paths that, that were existing. You know, as, as goods and people were starting to move from Asia into to Europe, so well, you know, what else moves along, along with those people? Animals also move. So the rats and the, 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 the ticks that were on the rats and the fleas and all this that helped to bring the plague to Europe, those moved along with, with that same sort of, of movement of, of goods and, and people. So this isn't necessarily something new that we're seeing in the contemporary era. What is perhaps uh, different about it or challenging is, is the, the, the speed, but also the sort of institutional architecture that we have to try to address it. And so we have things like the current uh, outbreak of Ebola that's happening in the DRC. I'm sure many of you have heard about this. The most recent numbers for this outbreak are about 3,100 cases of Ebola and um, about 2,000 people, about 2,100 people who have died already. This is the second largest outbreak of Ebola um, to date. So far, only, uh, uh, or only um, the only larger one was the one in West Africa in 2014 through 2016. And you know, this, on the one hand, this is incredibly remote. I mean, we were talking about, about the DRC, you know, largely up um, in the, the area up here is where, where most of the outbreak is, is occurring. But the reason that this is getting, um, getting attention is because we're also talking about an area near a bunch of international borders. So the ability to cross, uh, of the, the outbreak to cross borders is heightened. And then that makes it that much more challenging to try to address. Because it's one thing to try to get one government to do something about an infectious disease outbreak. It's another thing to get two or three governments to do it and to cooperate and to have similar sorts of, of strategies. With the, the, this current outbreak, though, we've also seen the World Health Organization declare what they call a public health emergency of international concern. And if nothing else, think of that as like the World Health Organization's bat signal. Oh my goodness, here is a big issue. This is something we all need to pay attention to because we don't want to see this spreading any further than it already has. And so that helps to facilitate bringing in uh, experts and resources from all over the world. Places that, that are incredibly far away suddenly have a vested interest in dealing with what's happening in the DRC. Or if you saw, um, you saw the recent reports, uh, there was a report in The Guardian today, actually, mm -hmm. about how the experts warned that the world is grossly unprepared for future pandemics. And this was a report that was done by a joint commission from the World Health Organization and the World Bank, looking at what sorts of steps we have taken in recent years, especially in the aftermath of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And what they've largely found is we haven't done enough. And it's, one, you know, it's not just about do we have enough drugs in the right places, do we have enough doctors, do we have enough hospital beds, but it's also about do we have the sorts of communication channels that are necessary in order to, to address this. Can we, can we snap into action quickly enough? And globalization forces us to need to be able to do that. We have to be able to snap into quick action if and when the, these sorts of outbreaks occur. And I should just say when these outbreaks occur because we know outbreaks will occur in the future. We don't know when, we don't know where, and we don't know of what, but we know that they will come in, in, in the future. So we need to find ways to be ready. And like I said, globalization puts that, that heightened risk, but also opens up some of those, those possibilities for, for cooperation. And, and I should say here that, the, the, that I'm going to focus a lot on infectious diseases in humans when I'm talking about this. Now, this is not the entirety of, of the sorts of health issues that we're dealing with, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit more. But I tend to focus on infectious diseases in humans, largely because that's what most of the institutional structure is built around. It's what it's set up for. But that said, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to effectively address this without thinking about these, I guess you could call them larger biosecurity issues. So it's not just human health, but also animal health, planet health, plant health, all of these sorts of, uh, of issues that, that come together. And so under this biosecurity rubric, 
we see a lot more concern about you know, how, do we, how do we deal with this interplay between humans, animals, uh, plants, and, and the environment. And this is something that a number of countries take very seriously. Australia, for instance, if any of you have traveled to Australia and you've gone through customs and you know that they, they, they search your bags, they want to know where you've been, what's, are you carrying any plants with you. I once had uh, chocolate chip cookies in my bag, some homemade chocolate chip cookies, and almost got denied entry into the country. But I am not the biggest biosecurity threat that Australia has faced over the past six years. Katy Perry is. <laughs> so Katy Perry here, Prism, it's, uh, 2013. This is the album that has Roar on it. So you know, great sort of empowerment song. Go out, you know, put it on your, your workout playlist. All that sort of good stuff. Why is she a biosecurity threat, though? She is a biosecurity threat. Well, it's not her, per se. It's actually this CD cover and the liner notes because the album was called Prism and she had this idea that she wanted to, um, she wanted people to spread light with the message that, that, that she was uh, promoting through her music. And so she embedded seeds within the liner notes. So you could go and plant the liner notes to your, the album, they'd grow, it'd be lovely, everything, you know, everything would be, be wonderful. The problem was that about half of those CDs were, were produced using seeds from outside of Australia. So the threat of introducing a new species into that environment raised all sorts of biosecurity red flags, and the government actually had to seize the vast majority of Katy Perry CDs in the, the country in 2013 in order to prevent those, those invasive species from happening. And that's a lot of the sort of challenges that we face when we're talking about the, these health issues. There's the, there are the things that we know, and there are the things that we don't know. So we know about influenza. We didn't know about something like SARS until 2002. Same sort of thing when we're talking about the, these sorts of biosecurity issues. We know that there are invasive plants and invasive species that alter ecosystems and can affect uh, population health, but we don't always know how those, those uh, effects are going to play out or which ones are going to have the most detrimental effect. So in some respects, we're trying, we have to be prepared for and ready to respond to things that we don't even know that they exist. And so how do we try to do that? That's what we're, we're trying to figure out. And a lot of our systems that, that do exist, when we're thinking about these sorts of security type issues, you know, we, think about, we tend to think about security in that, these military terms. And militaries can be, you know, they, they can have a role to play when we're talking about these sorts of global health crises. They can be incredible with logistics in particular. Um, in the Ebola outbreaks, we saw a number of, of countries when they were helping to set up Ebola treatment centers, would send their militaries. Because if you're talking about logistics, people who can set up buildings and get supplies to new areas in a really quick and efficient manner, militaries have unparalleled uh, resources in that, that respect. But in terms of the, the underlying day-to-day -day issues, they're not always the most effective. And so what are some of the, these sorts of, of challenges that, that we're thinking about? So there's one realm, which are the new threats. So that is the Ebola virus under an electron microscope, uh, magnified many, 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 many times. Um, I actually have a little plushie of the Ebola virus, which is, this is about um, one million times larger. Um, these are the sorts of things that people give you as Christmas gifts when you study the, this sort of stuff. So, um, but the reason that, that Ebola is interesting is because we had never heard of it before 1976. Doesn't mean it had never existed before 1976, but that's when it was first described in the medical literature. And in that time, we've seen about two dozen outbreaks. And they've varied incredibly widely in terms of their, their overall effects. So some have had just a handful of people who have contracted the, the, the virus. Some, like the, ones, uh, like the outbreak in West Africa, we're talking about tens of thousands of people spreading across multiple international borders and raising all sorts of concerns about if we are facing some sort of, of, of new global pandemic. So the new diseases like this, you know, this is something that we still don't have really a treatment for or a vaccine. We've got some very promising experimental treatments right now and some things are showing some real promise. But with these new sorts of, of outbreaks that we see, we don't really have the, the, the tools at the ready. We just have to try to treat the symptoms and hope for the best. So that poses a challenge, these new sorts of threats. 
Then we also have re-emergent threats, like tuberculosis here. And tuberculosis was, up until about the 1980s, that was just one of those things that people talked about in the past. You know, if you saw a movie that was set around the, you know, the late 1800s and early 1900s and someone coughed, they were going to die of tuberculosis. This is, you know, uh, Satine and Moulin Rouge, when she died, this is what she dies of. And so it was seen as a historical thing. But it's been resurgent over the past 30, 40 years. And the reason that it's resurgent is because of these other changes in the health uh, ecosystem. The increase in, in tuberculosis comes from kind of a combination of, of two different factors. One is HIV. So one in seven people in the world carry the tuberculosis uh, bacilli. And for most of us, our immune systems keep it in check. So it's there, but it's not making us sick, because that's what our immune systems are, are there to do. If someone has HIV, when they have a weakened immune system, the body's not able to keep that in check. And so you would have this co-infection that would happen. People would, be, would not only be HIV positive, but then they'd also have tuberculosis. So that allowed for, for the, the disease to spread. The second thing was access to medicines. So one of the issues that, that came up as, people were, as more people were falling ill with tuberculosis was whether or not they had ready access to reliable um, medical uh, interventions. And the treatment for tuberculosis for a long time had been effective, but it was really, really long. You had to make sure that the drugs were coming in on the right schedule and that, that you were taking them on the regular regimen. And if you weren't, that allowed for mutations to take place and make it that much more difficult to treat. And if we're talking about people who are in uh, areas where the healthcare facilities are inadequate, having to then go to an even more extensive line of drugs is that much more dangerous because your ability to have the regular access is limited. So these resurgent threats, things that we knew about but we thought we had taken uh, care of, those become issues. We also have to deal with the fact that not all these threats are just about humans, but also about animal vectors. So mosquitoes are incredible, aside from being just annoying, they're incredibly effective vectors for spreading disease. So everything from malaria to West Nile, Nile virus to the Zika virus that we heard about a few years ago that nearly threatened to uh, postpone or cancel the Summer Olympics that were held in Brazil. Fun fact about that, they did a study to see how many people got sick from Zika during the, the Summer Olympics. Zero. Because fortunately, it, when you are having the Summer Olympics in Brazil in August, that's actually the winter. And mosquitoes don't really go around much in the winter. So thank you, Equator, I guess, um, for doing that. But more broadly, it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about how we are going to provide treatment for these sorts of viruses or, or, or bacilli. It's another thing when we have to think about another creature that exists. Because trying to, to stop the spread of, of malaria um, or, or Zika necessarily goes beyond just having good bug spray. Because mosquitoes have, have their niche within, within the environment. So when we're talking about, about these animal vectors, you know, animals also don't respect borders. And so it's one thing to try to treat, um, treat, say, a Zika outbreak in Brazil. That may not do anything for the, for the neighbors in Argentina, though. So you have to have these sorts of coordinated strategies when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about uh, the, these sorts of animal vectors. Uh, and then finally, we've also got the issue of antimicrobial resistance. And this is an area that we've actually started to see a fair amount of international action taking place. So with antimicrobial resistance, you know, these drugs that, that, that we've used to treat common infections and illnesses are becoming less effective. And they become less effective because we are over-prescribing them, because there is a lack of quality control, because we are putting them into the food system. And, and we don't really have a lot of backups. It's not like we've got tons and tons of other antibiotics that we can just roll out and, and easily use. And so this is something that the international community has started to come together and say, what can we do about this? How can we come to some sort of understanding around um, addressing this? 
But again, here's where some of the, these issues around globalization come into play, is how do you then incentivize international pharmaceutical manufacturers to both want to do research on developing new antibiotics, but also make sure that the people who need access to those drugs can afford to get those drugs. That's a, that becomes a, a big challenge in doing this. So it's, it's a combination of both the political and the scientific in, in this, this realm. Like I said, the, the ease of movement is where we see, uh, see a number of these, these challenges, but also some of the, these opportunities. So on the, the challenges side, this map up here is an outbreak of MERS. MERS is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It is actually related to SARS, the same uh, virus family. They're both coronaviruses. And this is also a relatively new disease. And the best idea that we have for where it comes from is camels. That in and of itself is not surprising. About 75% of human infections come from, from animal sources. So, um, so there, there's some sort of transmission that's happening. And so you see you know, where we've got the, the big red dots and more of the, the green colors. You know, a lot of that is centered in places that have lots of camels. Makes sense. Okay, camel disease, pe people around camels, great. And then you look at Seoul, South Korea, which has a big red dot. I have not been to Korea, but I do not believe it to be a hot spot for camels. <laughs> what, it does, what does seem to be going on there is that this is again related to the ease of travel across borders. That there was a tour group that had, been coming, that had come from Korea, went to the Middle East, someone inadvertently got ill, went back to, to Korea, and People didn't know what was going on. They had no reason to suspect a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome was going to be affecting East Asia. And so it took a while for doctors to figure it out, which allowed for the, the outbreak to spread um, a bit. But again, that those same sorts of challenges that, that allowed for the outbreak to take place, there, were also the, there was also the ability of doctors to work across borders. Once they started to identify this, they could use those sorts of diagnostic techniques, draw on laboratory skills as a way of trying to, uh, to eventually stop the spread of, of this outbreak. Or you've also got, got Zika, as, as we mentioned a little bit uh, before. And it, Zika was first de uh, described in Uganda in the 1940s. Um, doesn't make its way over to, uh, to the Americas until 2015. And you know, mosquitoes can travel far, but they probably can't cross oceans by themselves. But what they can do is they can, take, they can hop rides on tanker ships, those big massive ships that, that we use to transport goods across the ocean. And so you know, we're still trying to figure out exactly how uh, how the disease made its way across, um, across the Pacific Ocean, but it seems like there's some relationship between the movement of goods, in this case, and the ability of mosquitoes to hitch a ride. And then they come into this new environment, they're like, oh my goodness, this is a virgin territory, it is ours, and it leads to this sort of, of outbreak. But at the same time, we've got all of these, these incredible uh, examples of how transnational activism has been able to promote health, to try to challenge some of the, these sorts of, of issues, and to make sure that, that, that governments are paying attention, that international organizations are working on these issues, and that there, is, uh, that there are resources going into to these sorts of, of things. So you know, here we've got Nelson Mandela wearing uh, the HIV positive t-shirt that was uh, one of the, the key emblems of the treatment action campaign in South Africa. South Africa had the, the highest number of people who were HIV positive um, in the, the, about the time that this picture was taken, roughly 20% of the adult population was HIV positive. So that's a huge percentage, that's a huge number of, of people. And one of the things that the Treatment Action Campaign was really trying to call attention to was, we need drugs. We need to have development of drugs that, that are going to stop um, to stop the spread of HIV, that are going to, to allow people to live longer lives, but we also need to make sure that once those drugs are developed, that we have access to them. And so something like, uh, like HIV then becomes embroiled in these larger debates about intellectual property rights. 
You know, the same sorts of rights that make it, uh, that, that decide whether or not you can watch Game of Thrones on the streaming service in the US versus in Canada versus another country, same sort of thing that, that plays out whether or not you are able to get access to medical uh, interventions. And it's through, it's through this, this sort of public protest, this sort of, of, of public engagement, this transnational activism, that groups like Tran uh, the Treatment Action Campaign were able to call attention to what was happening in South Africa. We all, you know, similarly, we saw a group, uh, we've seen groups like ACT UP uh, that was started here in the United States but had chapters throughout Europe calling attention in particular to many of these same sorts of issues. Where is the research? Where is the funding for addressing HIV AIDS issues? Where are the supportive services? And th these sorts of transnational activism um, movements are not just limited to, to HIV. And they're not just limited to infectious drugs, or excuse me, infectious diseases. So a few years back, the World Health Organization, for the first time ever, crafted an international treaty. It's the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the FCTC. And this was spearheaded by activist groups all around the world, in, in wealthy countries, in poor countries, all around the world, saying, we need to fight back against tobacco companies. We need to find ways to stop people from smoking, to allow them to quit, you know, provide services to, to make sure that they can quit, and to, to um, open up the possibilities for people to, say, grow crops other than tobacco in order to earn their livelihoods. And it was through this sort of transnational activism that, that these groups were able to get an international organization to be willing to essentially stand up to these transnational tobacco control or transnational tobacco companies and say, hey, we're going to put some restrictions on advertisements. We're going to, to um, uh, we're going to encourage countries to put more money into uh, smoking cessation programs and these sorts of things. Now that treaty could mandate countries to do that because international law doesn't really give us that power. But the fact that we had nearly every country in the world coming together to say, yep, this is something that, that we need to do, that's an important, uh, an important message and shows the power of those, those sorts of connections to help build that cooperation. So that's where something like the World Health Organization really comes into play. So the World Health Organization is one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations. It's been around since 1948. Um, it is an organization where Every country in the world that is a member of the United Nations is automatically also a member of the World Health Organization unless you specifically opt out. And so far, one country in the world has specifically opted out of being a member of the World Health Organization. And it is Liechtenstein, which is roughly about the size and population of this room. I do not, I have asked so many colleagues to try to explain what's going on with Liechtenstein and no one can figure it out. But, but interestingly enough, they also allow for membership of other um, non-sovereign non states to join. So, so there are some Pacific Island states that, that aren't recognized as independent, um, that, that have membership. So there are 194 members uh, within the World Health Organization. And so this is this great forum for trying to, over, uh, trying to facilitate that, that cooperation that, that globalization can help to, to encourage, but also to, to make sure that we've got that sort of readiness uh, uh, the, the sorts of readiness skills av available. Doesn't mean that it doesn't get caught up in politics though. So for instance, during that SARS outbreak, the, the majority of the, the cases that we saw were in China, um, on the mainland of China and in Hong Kong. The second most number of cases was in Taiwan. And if you know about the, the political uh, the political machinations within the world, or within the United Nations around the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, this becomes a big issue. Because the World Health Organization was asking the Chinese government, hey, can we go to Taiwan to try to address this? And the Chinese government was like, we're not super cool with that. And the reason was because they were afraid that would legitimize Taiwan as an independent state. If the World Health Organization can have independent contact with Taiwan, does that then mean that they could use that as leverage to get membership into the World Health Organization? Or to then try to apply for membership into the United Nations as a whole, or, or something else? And so this is, again, one of the, the, these other sorts of, uh, of tensions that pop up, is that science is not apolitical. You know, we may understand the, the, the etiology of these diseases or how to treat them when, when the, these outbreaks occur, 
But that doesn't mean that it's just a turnkey, okay, we'll just implement that, that sort of policy. These inherently get caught up in the sort of, of politics that, that are at play here. And one of the things that, that, that we see the World Health Organization trying to do these days is to think about what, what do we have to be on guard against? What do we have to worry about? So there was a, a study that came out, uh, I believe it was February of last year, and they listed these diseases, these, what, two, four, six, eight diseases as kind of their top, the things that they were most worried about. Not because they were the most virulent, not because they caused the highest number of illnesses, but because these were the things that they said, if there were to be a large scale outbreak, we're not sure that we really have the tools to address it. We don't have treatments, we don't have a lot of research, and so we'd, we would kind of be caught with our pants down if there were big outbreaks of this. Um, so you've got things like Crimean uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Lhasa, uh, MARS, Nipah, Rift Valley fever, Zika, diseases that most of us haven't heard of, which is a good thing for the most part. But then you have disease X. And disease X is not a disease. It is the unknown. This is that, that new. What is the next Ebola? What is the next virus that, that we had not previously seen? The next disease that we had not previously seen? And how do we try to prepare for dealing with something like that? And, and I don't frequently like to, to cite Donald Rumsfeld in a positive way, but <laughs> These are the known unknowns. And how do we prepare for this? We have all of these really great surveillance systems, for instance. These disease surveillance systems so that we can, that we can monitor when outbreaks occur and try to, uh, try to stop them in their tracks. But how do we make sure that we're not just looking for the things that we already know about? On the flip side, how do you look for things that you don't know they exist? And this is where, this is that, that, that unique tension that, that globalization brings into global health. Because on the one hand, you know, things that we would never, that, that may have never been able to take root in a human population, now might have an opportunity because of the movement of goods and people and the, ability, the ease with which uh, the travel can occur. On the other hand, we've also got the ability to share that information, to make sure that that is, is being widely distributed, and to build those movements, to, to, to share the, that, 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 those sorts of, of insights here. And so this really taps into that sort of, of, of unique tension there. Now, over the past 20 years or so, we have seen incredible progress in fostering global health cooperation. If you look at um, the increase in development assistance for health between 1990 and about, uh, 2000, uh, about 2010, so over that, that 20 year period, you go from about $5 billion to about $35 billion. So a seven-fold increase in just 20 years. That's largely plateaued um, in, in the past eight, nine years. And that's plateaued for, for a few reasons. Um, one is this idea of just donor fatigue. It's a lot to, to, to keep asking for countries to keep increasing their, their, um, their foreign aid contributions year after year. Um, so that, that, that's one issue. You, you've got a second issue with uh, coming to, into questioning strategies, I guess, for lack of a better term. Are we over-medicalizing things? Is it more about the social determinants of health or is it more about medical technologies? And some of those conflicts that, that are happening make, uh, have made, um, have made some, some countries less inclined to, to want to give development assistance for health. Excuse me. The third, is the, is the factor of just political change. So we have seen with, um, in recent years that when uh, President Trump has pre presented his budgetary priorities, global health funds have been slashed. Now, Congress has gone back and re-upped those allocations so that we've actually tried to, to maintain things at about a, a plateau at that, that same level. But this is not just unique to the United States. We've seen a number of countries where, where there's questioning about multilateralism, about internationalization, and about the, the necessity of engaging with other countries. Um, we've seen that lead to a flatlining, if not a decrease, in, in global health assistance. And, but we have seen some changes to these sorts of systems. And again, this is where globalization comes into play as a way of bringing new actors into the fold. So Bill Gates here, 
His foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is the world's wealthiest philanthropic organization with about $50 billion in their endowment. Bill Gates and his foundation alone provide about as much money for global health programs as the World Health Organization can provide in a single year. Now, on the one hand, you're like, that's kind of out of whack. If, if we've got the, you know, a foundation that has, th uh, trust, has three trustees being able to give as much money as something that, that represents nearly the entire world. On the other hand, that allows for some flexibility, some specialization. The Gates Foundation historically has not done a lot of direct service provision, for instance. They're not actually uh, putting doctors into the field, but they're able to fund research and development on treatment and new drugs and vaccines and those sorts of things, things that the World Health Organization um, has not been able to do because it just simply doesn't have, have the money. We've also seen recently um, the creation of the Chan Zuckerberg, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, started by Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg. Priscilla Chan is a pediatrician who is married to this guy who is probably on all of our phones right now and probably listening to this talk for all we know. Um, but they have pledged to use the vast majority of their stock in Facebook as, as, a, as a way to, to, to give back. And because of Priscilla Chan's own connection as a pediatrician by training, um, they've been interested in putting some of this money into to global health issues. So, it's outside of, government, um, outside of government monies, which opens up questions about legitimacy and authority and control, but it introduces new money into the system. So again, it's the, the, those sorts of trade-offs that, that, that we see happening here. Um, but as we're thinking about where, why this is something that the international community needs to pay attention to, we know that there are economic effects. From, from outbreaks. Even small outbreaks can have, can have pretty dire consequences on a country's uh, gross domestic product. And again, because viruses aren't going to respect borders, this isn't just going to be limited to a single country. Um, we also know that outbreaks can lead to restrictions on travel. Now, they're not supposed to under international regulations, but we see, uh, we, we've seen a number of the, these restrictions that have been put in place, and these restrictions don't always make medical sense. So for instance, during, um, during the swine flu outbreak of about, uh, about a decade or so ago, um, there was a, a case where, where a plane load of, of Mexican tourists were detained in China and said, you can't come off the plane because this flu began in Mexico. We also saw restrictions on pork products because the idea was, well, the swine flu comes from pigs, pigs produce pork, ergo, this might lead to to an outbreak. There's no connection there whatsoever, but these are the sorts of things that, that can happen and introduce, uh, introduce those sorts of barriers to, to commerce. And then, like I mentioned before, you know, there, are, there are these questions about access to drugs. Who's going to be able to, to get access to these drugs when these outbreaks do occur? The systems that we have um, don't always mean that the people who need the drugs can, uh, can get access to them. So I, I'll, I'll close up there and we'll, we'll, we, can, we can take some questions, but I guess the thing that I want to, to really hit home is that globalization makes health a lot scarier, but also opens up a lot of really great opportunities. And the question for, for our political leadership, for our social leadership, is how do we harness those good sides um, and those opportunities to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to be felled by, by the, these diseases? We still know that we want to travel. We still know that we want to trade. We still want to take advantage of the, these, these uh, opportunities that globalization has provided. We can also take advantage of, of the social and the political context to make sure that, that those diseases don't stop us from, from making that movement. Um, because I spend my time talking about uh, horrible uh, and deadly sorts of things, I think we always, always need to end with, with puppies. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And yeah, thanks. Oh, so she was asking if our travel records would, on our, would, would help if they were on our medical records as well. Is that the, that's an interesting um, idea. I think it would, it's definitely one of those um, issues within travel medicine. They oftentimes say, like, let us know where, where you've been um, so that, that we can have reason to, to understand we should pay a little bit more attention. Oh, you've recently been in this country that had this outbreak of this disease. Maybe we should, we should be sure to test for that or at least be, be sensitive to it. Um, I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. There, you know, 
medical records always get a little bit tricky because people worry about the privacy issues and who, you know, who's putting that, that information in there and who's going to have access to that information. So I think there'd probably be pushback from, from making that a formal part of medical records, but absolutely sharing that, that sort of information and just being very cognizant about that. Um, and be self-reporting. Being This is a time when I think being a hypochondriac can actually be, be useful. If you've recently traveled and you get back and you're not feeling super great, sometimes you just feel run down after a day, after some international travel. But it might also be worth just going in and saying, hey, so you know, I spent 14 hours in an airplane a few days ago and now I'm not feeling super great. Um, it, might there be a connection between that? Yeah, so the, so the question is about uh, people who have immune suppression because of other dr uh, diseases that, or excuse me, other drugs that they might be taking or other sorts of conditions that they might have and whether that's contributing to, to, to some of that. Is that it? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that, that, it, that is a great point. That is also why I, um, I think we've got a certain obligation to ourselves and to each other to try to take care of ourselves when, because we know that there are people in our community who might be in that sort of situation. So. Um, you know, this is where I get really uh, passionate about vaccinating kids because we know that there are people in our communities who cannot get who cannot get vaccinated or might have their immune systems compromised for a variety of reasons, and the more people that we have vaccinated, the less likelihood that something like measles is going to be able to take root in in a community. Um, but but I, you know there there are definitely the, these other sorts of. Of, of conditions, and this is where we're trying to address societal health becomes so challenging because we've got so many moving parts that, that are, are um, at play, and we don't want to inadvertently cause more illness down the road trying to address the, the, the immediate sort of thing. So I, yeah, I think that, that, that you know, these sorts of, the, the, the presence of, of immunosuppression just because of other health conditions that people are, are dealing with definitely contributes, but I think also puts a certain obligation on all of us to, to do our best to try to limit the, <coughs> excuse me, limit the likelihood that we would be spreading something to, to another person. Yeah, so she's asking about the permafrost, and basically the, the fact that permafrost is melting means that, that bodies that you know, died of, of diseases uh, long ago are coming back to the surface. What do we do about the possibility of reintroduction of those, the, those illnesses into the population? Um, and I guess there's kind of a, a good news, bad news sort of thing there. So, um, or maybe it's kind of good news, good news. We'll, we'll figure out what kind of news it is. So on the one hand, this is, has actually been useful for understanding things like the 1918-1919 flu pandemic. So by being able to, to get access to, to, to those bodies, that's given researchers an ability to try to get a better sense of why that, that outbreak was so devastating. Um, and it doesn't seem like we, we've seen outbreaks that, that are, are necessarily coming into, or that, that you know, the viruses are starting to spread from those bodies from that long time ago. But it speaks to this larger issue about how climate change also then has an effect on our health status. Because not only do you have things like permafrost that is melting, but as you see increases in temperatures, that could also potentially increase the range where mosquitoes could, could live. And if we increase those, those, um, those territories, that could also then lead to things like the reintroduction of malaria into regions where it hasn't been present for, for a long time. So I think your question actually speaks to some of the, these, these larger issues um, about how, and, and this is one of the, the the underappreciated elements within, within climate change is the, the, the effect on health. And it goes beyond just infectious diseases. So if, as we're seeing increases in heat waves, that has a huge effect on, on individual health. And, we, and particularly for, for the elderly, we see rising death rates in cities with, um, when, when they've been experiencing these massive heat waves that we've seen, um, seen in, in recent years. And that also speaks to some of the social determinants of health and just the, the you know, what sort of community, community engagement do we have? What sort of services do we have to check in on people just to make sure that they're, they're doing okay as the, 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 the climate is, is changing? So climate change, yeah, the, the permafrost and the, the, the change in the permafrost speaks to these larger issues about, about climate change and health and the interplay there. Um, and it's not necessarily a great story right now. Yeah, so he's asking about, you know, we're talking about diseases that may have relatively few numbers. Why not focus on, on you know, access to, to clean water or food or these sorts of, or climate change? These things are going to, to uh, affect millions, if not billions of people. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if we look at a city like Cape Town, uh, essentially running out of water, 
that's going to be absolutely devastating on, on so many different levels. And I would say that there are probably, there are two reasons that, that, that I tend to focus on, on sort of the infectious disease side of things. One is that we can never know in advance how far these things are going to spread. So SARS we ended up being able to contain, but who knows how much further it would have, have, have spread. So there, there, there's that need for vigilance. The other thing though, and this is where, where where we run into a lot of problems is just how the institutional architecture exists. So right now we've got a really, uh, we've got a pretty good architecture for dealing with, with infectious diseases and the outbreaks that, that are occurring in other countries or spreading across international borders. We don't yet have that same sort of, of robust institutional structure to deal with some of these other issues like climate change, like food, like, like clean water. And even um, you know, looking at that interplay between human, animal, and planet health, there's this idea that people have termed one health. And you know, needing to understand the interplay there, that's kind of fallen through the cracks on the international level because no organization has taken that on as this is ours. It's kind of World Health Organization, it's kind of World Food Program, it's kind of Food and Agricultural Organization, it's kind of uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, but because it's not any single organization, it's kind of fallen, fallen by the wayside. And so this is where I think that the, the larger global health infrastructure, the institutional infrastructure, is very much rooted in 1948 and the sorts of way, the ways that we conceptualized health in 1948 and in the 1950s and the 1960s, it has not yet caught up to, to these, these challenges. And so this is, is more of a reflection of based on the institutional structure as we currently have it, it is not necessarily a normative argument saying that this is how it should be. I think you're absolutely right that, that if we are going to effectively address this, we need to take a much, a much broader, a much more holistic sense of what constitutes health and what sorts of factors play into to health. So this is just kind of a, a reflection of where we're at, not necessarily where we should be. Yeah, so she's asking about the overprescription of penicillin and you know, the effects, uh, particularly in the, the global north, how that has a, an effect on globalization and how that's affected by globalization. Um, yeah, the, yeah, this is absolutely, um, th this is why, why issues around antimicrobial resistance have actually started to get some attention from the United Nations and from the World Health Organization. We actually saw a high-level summit hosted by the United Nations dealing with antimicrobial resistance about a year ago. So it's something that, that has, um, has started to receive uh, greater attention. I think the, the, the holdup at this point for trying to, to move that forward really does start to hit on some of those, those issues around intellectual property rights and around um, the, the incentives for research and development. For, you know, for better or worse, a lot of the research and development in pharmaceuticals is being done by pharmaceutical companies. And those pharmaceutical companies, you know, penicillin is not a big money maker for anyone. Antibiotics are not really big money makers for, for drug manufacturers. And so from their strict, from a strict cost benefit analysis, that's probably not where they want to put their resources. We could, give, we could probably do a better job if we are you know, developing the next Viagra or, 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 some, or a, chronic, uh, a, a, a treatment for a chronic condition, something that someone's going to have to take for the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, of their lives. And that's actually where I think some of these other types of organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation can actually play a role because they can, they can provide some of that seed grant. They're, they don't have the same sort of, of cost benefit analysis. They don't have the same sort of profit loss ratios that they need to worry about. Um, there have been other efforts, um, particularly within the European Union, but, uh, but also more broadly, about trying to get some state-supported cross-national pharmaceutical research and, and trying to set it up in such a way so that, there, that these, any, sort of, any resultant drugs would not necessarily have the same sort of patent protection. Or they would be patented, but the patent would be given away freely to any manufacturer um, who wanted to, to, to manufacture the drug. So th there are some efforts trying to deal with that, but because it runs into that, that buzzsaw of the World Trade Organization and intellectual property rights and research and development, it's been a little bit harder to try to move forward with saying, we moving beyond the we have a problem to now, here's how we are going to address that problem. Here's how we're going to try to stop it before it gets any worse. Yeah, so, so Abdi's asking about the, the sort of the relationship between socioeconomic status and health status and how those, those, those relate. And I would say, yes, those relate both on a national level but also within, within countries. So if we look at, um, you know, if we look at just those, the, the global map, which countries are able to, 
uh, to, to spend the most on health are able to, to spend more. It's not a perfect correlation, but countries that, that, that are able to spend more on health, provide more resources for their healthcare system, tend to have better health outcomes. It's, it's more likely that people are going to be able to have access to healthcare facilities. They're going to be able to be treated before something becomes a bigger problem or before it spreads too far. They're going to have laboratory diagnostic systems that are going to allow them to um, identify problems before they, they, they go that much further. Again, not, not a perfect correlation, but there's definitely a relationship um, that, that does exist. But then even within countries, we see that same sort of thing. And this is where you get to this idea about the social determinants of health. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, it's one thing about do I have access to, um, can I go to the pharmacy? Can I go to the doctor? Am I running enough? Am I going to the gym? These, these sorts of things. But the, socioecon- or the, the social determinants of health get to some of these issues around do I have, um, do I have safe and adequate housing? Do I have access to clean water? Do I ha- am I living in an environment that is, that is relatively clean? Or am I living in an environment that has lots of air pollution? Um, and these sorts of social determinants of health play as big, if not bigger, um, a role. If you look at the, the, the public health statistics uh, and the, the change in life expectancy, medical technologies definitely help, help life expectancy to expand. But expanding things like access to sanitation and clean water and improving the, the air went even further. And so, so there's that, that sort of relationship where, where, so, where socioeconomic status, both of countries and of individuals within countries, definitely plays, plays, um, uh, plays a role. So it doesn't, it's not just about the amount of money that's being spent, but you, know, you need to have a, a basic set of resources there and make sure that people have access to, to those resources in order to, to be able to take advantage of those healthcare facilities. Yeah, so she's asking about the, sort of the disappearance of social determinants of, of health from a lot of this conversation around health. And I, I think th- you're kind of right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I can't understand why, because it seems to me to be... It seems, yeah, it's so, yeah, right. I mean, it seems so basic. I, I think part, I would look at it um, on two different levels. One is that it can be it can be a bit harder to, to quantify how we're making those improvements in social determinants of health. Not to say it's impossible, but in order to tell a government, hey, because you provided these resources, we were able to do this that helped to improve these social determinants of health. That can be a bit, of a, a bit harder. Again, not to say it's impossible by any stretch of the imagination, but it can be a bit harder for, uh, for our government to wrap its brain around as opposed to we distributed 5,000 doses of this drug. So that, that, that's one thing. But I think the other thing is also about sort of the broader political conversations that we've had. If you think about the move from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were, were time limited. We're going to do this in 15 years. We've got these very clear indicators of what we're going to do. And, many, and in many ways brought in a lot of these social determinants of health. Even the, you know, we're not, even the ones that weren't not, were, yeah, were not quote unquote health goals per se, were contributing to, uh, to health. So cleaning up the environment, making sure that, that, that kids were able to go to school, that actually has an effect on the social determinants of health. With, with uh, you know, once we got to 2015 and that time frame for the Millennium Development Goals uh, ended and we moved to the Sustainable Development Goals, it's a little fuzzier. And so I don't think it's got that same sort of international cachet um, which makes it hard to then rally governments around it and trying to get that, that sort of uh, support from governments, from non-governmental organizations, and from civil society writ large. So I think, there's, I, I think we still see pockets of these conversations around the social determinants of health, but it's about how do we get those back up to the, the, the higher levels. That's where, it, where, that's where I think there's a disconnect that, that, that is muting some of that conversation. Absolutely, the, the interdisciplinarity of it definitely speaks to it. And that, you know, this is something that we've seen uh, in looking at the, the outbreak teams for something like, like Ebola. You know, as someone who's trained as a, as a political scientist, a lot of my, my colleagues who look at, at global health politics say, how did you not have political scientists looking at how governments were going to, to relate to these sorts of things if you're trying to get a bunch of governments to cooperate on responding to a disease outbreak? Um, I have uh, one of my good friends is a medical anthropologist and she was flabbergasted that there weren't more people. There, were, there wasn't more of a conversation with medical anthropologists because you're talking about changing people's funeral uh, burial rites. That's going, you know, you're, you're going to need to be able to understand the cultures. And it's not just about knowing, having the, the medical know-how. It's also about understanding how that interplays with all these other parts of, of culture. But yeah, the interdisciplinarity definitely um, make, can make it a bit more of a challenge. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you again. Mm-hmm.
Thank you.